Friends, this morning my question for you is, how are you? And I mean that really. How are you? Because people toss that question around, me included, as a polite social ritual, and we often don't really allow the other person so much as a chance to honestly reflect on it, let alone answer it with any depth, besides something like, oh, pretty well, thanks. It's often more rhetorical than driven by any actual curiosity. So, just take a moment, and I'm not going to ask for a spoken aloud answer from each of you, but really do take a moment and ask, how have you been this week? Have you had worries or struggles on your mind? Have you had concerns for another? Maybe you're feeling upbeat and full of optimism. Maybe you're sitting here right now really wishing you hadn't left your laundry on the washing line. Are you feeling tired? Have you been feeling full of vim and vigour? Now that last bit I ask, and to be honest, I'm not entirely sure what vim is, but it's always paired with vigour, so it sounds good. And as I ask you to reflect on how you've been this week, it's likely you've remembered just how difficult it is to sum up how you've been feeling across the course of seven days in just one word or phrase. Chances are you've felt everything from joyful to melancholic to frustrated to exhausted to determined and inspired to lazy to bored to peaceful and hopefully back to joyful again. And no matter how dramatic the range of emotions you've felt, you will have felt some variation because you're alive and because you're human and because your body and spirit is a living, dynamic thing and exists in relationship to your circumstances and environment. For me, when I'm asked how I've been, usually the only succinct and honest answer I can come up with is... With is well, I have definitely been. That's usually about as much as I can be sure of. Possibly for reasons of my personal health, possibly because I'm an egomaniac and inclined to spend a lot of time navel-gazing, I reflect where I am in my emotional state of being a lot of the time. I'm that personality type, or of that personality type, whose thinking is very much influenced by my emotions, and so I figure that recognising and owning where I am at any given point is good honesty and accountability when I preach or interact with others. If I've been angry or deflated or busting with energy and creativity, I should understand that's the field by which I'm responding that week. To life, to other people, to the goings-on of the world, to the Holy Spirit, and importantly, to Scripture. Please hear that point about the current state of a person's feelings and thinking influencing the way they interpret scripture on any given day. We talk a lot about the layers we have to pass through in gaining an understanding of a scriptural text, about the circumstances and context of its original composition, about linguistic translation issues, about many centuries of editorialising. But besides all of that, once we even begin to pick all of that apart, we, the one reading, whatever modern version of the text, with all of our internal baggage, both the long-term stuff and the short-term of that day, that's the last filter. We are the last filter through which the words passed into our minds and hearts. And how even exactly are we meant to process the words of Scripture anyway? Are we supposed to think about them deeply on an intellectual level? Are we supposed to feel them deeply in our heart, on an emotional level? Do we take them into our being and be transformed somehow on a spiritual or mystical or metaphysical level? Do we evaluate them on a social, political, ethical level? The answer is probably all of the above. Well, each one of us, depending on who we are and our personality and our background, will generally be inclined towards a different mode of response, and that will generally vary on any given day we come to it. If we do open the Bible in our lives outside of a gathered worship here or an intentional Bible study, are we looking for something specific when we do? Are we seeking comfort? Are we seeking provocation? Are we seeking a confirmation of our own worldview? Are we seeking something to object to or get upset about? 
because whatever we are looking for, we will find it. The combined scriptures are a diverse library, even if we print the text in small enough font to fit them all inside one cover and call it the Bible. I caught up with a person this week who was a little bothered by a passage they'd read that morning in a little book of daily Bible readings. Basically, they were reminded of a theological theme they didn't connect with, intellectually or spiritually. So we broke it down together and we talked it through. I spoke about the passage in its context of who it was speaking to in the time it was written, and that person asked a really important question. How can we say the Bible is speaking to us today? That question woke me up and reminded me of something that I often forget. Many Christians operate with the assumption the Bible is speaking to us today, that it was somehow written to us and for us. And I'm sorry if this is not fashionable for a minister to say, and my perhaps too honest answer is that no, it wasn't, and no, it doesn't. I don't consider the Bible to be speaking to us today. I consider the Holy Spirit to be speaking to us today. Sit with that difference for a moment. If I try to define my sense of how that works, I'd say scripture to us is a resource of understanding and reflection and contemplation and investigation and learning by which we might encounter the Holy Spirit, but through which we might encounter the presence of Christ. Perhaps it is the Bible is not a religion in itself. In the time of Jesus, there was nothing resembling what we now call the Bible. For the first century faith community at Ephesus, there was nothing resembling what we now call the Bible. Jesus never said, write this down, and he never said, open a book. Jesus quoted Jewish scripture for sure, but always in direct conversation with what was happening in the here and now of his time and place. And it sticks with me pointedly that one of the most confident quotas of scripture in all of the gospel stories was the devil when he appeared to Jesus in the wilderness. Then again, that story sticks with me because it's written down in Scripture. So the whole thing is not complex, is complex and it's not easily reconciled for me. I respect Scripture, not idolize Scripture, because of what I've read and learned from Scripture. Bit of a paradox, isn't it? Many folks I talk to who hold negative views of Christianity will criticize the faith based on the Christian readiness to regard the Bible as a magical book. In fact, many folks will criticise any religious person as believing in magic, or at least in a magical worldview. And we should talk about magic here, because our assigned passage today from the Gospel of John has some folks hassling Jesus for bigger and better magic tricks. They've chased him down. They've appreciated all the bread and fish in their bellies, but now they want the real magic show, like bread falling from the sky. I mean, feeding a hungry multitude is all well and good, they reckon, but if Jesus wants to win a religious of his own, he should have, a religion of his own, he should at least be able to do mind-blowing tricks on demand. What these people don't understand is Jesus doesn't want to win a religion of his own. He wants students. He wants thinkers. He wants people freed from the tribalism and fixed thinking of closed religious circles. His being, his manner and character, his way, his example, his relationship with divinity and humanity, he is the bread of life. Not the shining, glorious and awesome movement of stars, sun and moon of life, but the bread of life. Just bread. Plain, old, common, everyday sustenance. Not fancy, but utterly necessary and eminently available and easily shared. Bread is not so magical. Or maybe it is. Without growing bread or other carbohydrate-rich staples like rice or potatoes or corn... Life for human beings is a daily work of hunting and gathering for short-term energy that fills us long enough to seek out more. And it's important here that we shouldn't forget in Australia that First Nations people, they harvested native grass seeds to make a kind of flour prior to white folk showing up. They were baking damper long before Europeans figured out bread making and later bought flour from cereal grains here. 
I digress. Today, we're wary of taking too much energy into our bodies from high carbohydrate foods. Keto diets and other carbohydrate avoiding diets have become very popular. But then again, we're a lot more sedentary than folks in the first century and need a lot more cal less calories in a day. Back then, on your feet much of the time, moving your body most of the day, if you had some nuts and berries, great. You could sustain yourself in that movement for a little while. But if you had some bread, you could feed yourself, feed your community, feed your family, and maybe have some energy left over to investigate yourself, deepen yourself, and to pay that out into the community and the world. So maybe that's one very simple definition of what it means to live by the bread of life. Investigate yourself, deepen yourself, and pay your energy out into the world. That doesn't sound so much like magic to me as it does being religious in the way that I reckon that Jesus prompts me to think of being religious. As living a divinely inspired religion of humanity and of life and of simple sustainable kindness. My wife, Laura, studied under a wonderful lecturer in anthropology who offered this simple distinction between magic and religion. Religious folk think the power to affect change is external to them. Magic folk think the power to change is something they can personally wield and control. So religious folk, the power is outside. Magical thinking, the power is inside. I use it. I like that very simple distinction, and I also think those lines are often unfortunately blurred. So, in the ancient European Wiccan tradition, a bad witch was one who moved from revering and believing in and drawing on the power of nature to trying to exercise personal ownership and control over that power for themselves. And I think that often applies to our faith. I think there's plenty of bad Christians out there treating the Bible like a spell book from which they memorize all the magical words and then presume they have the power to declare what God is and isn't going to do in ways that suit their interests and desires. That's wizardry in any other language. It's nothing like discipleship. The Bible isn't a spell book. It isn't even a cookbook. It doesn't even contain a complete working recipe for bread. What it does do is point us towards meeting the bread of life. And it holds plenty of suggestions for what we do when we are fed by that bread. For who we become. For what the world might become. Jesus Christ, the way of love and grace and wisdom in the everyday, God's simple truth and love revealed and made flesh, is the word and the book we students keep open. Amen.